This video is sponsored by Brilliant.org. It's the 1970s. Star Wars has just come out. Disco is cool. And scientists are saying that we might all freeze to death due to global cooling. That's right. Before the current focus by scientists and the media on global warming, they used to be more worried about the potential of the Earth entering a new ice age. Two scientists, George Cutler and Robert Matthews, even went so far as to write a letter to President Nixon warning him that we may be about to see unprecedented cooling, human-induced change to the world's climate. Sound familiar? So why did scientists change their minds so spectacularly? What made them flip from global cooling to global warming? Whatever happened to global cooling? The thing about the 1970s is that as well as being desperately uncool, it was when climate research began to really mature into a modern research field. The Earth's climate has been studied academically arguably since the 11th century in China, and mathematically since the work of Joseph Fourier in the 18th century when he discovered the greenhouse effect. But in the early 20th century, things notably gathered pace as more and more physical principles of how the atmosphere, the ocean, and the sun interact were understood through more and more studies. And by the 19th 70s, more and more data was becoming available. In particular, the first reconstructions of the Earth's global average temperature, and the first continuous measurements of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. That data was being studied by lots of different groups of scientists, and they didn't all agree on what they found. Climate science isn't a single thing. There are loads of subfields that make it up. It's the same with most scientific disciplines. So imagine if Simon and I weren't atmospheric physicists, but instead were rocket scientists. Now, firstly, wouldn't that be awesome? But secondly, even if Simon and I were working on and understood the same rocket, he might be focused on liftoff and I might be researching steering. Well, there are plenty of aspects of the climate that researchers figure out too. There's observing the climate, whether that's what's happening today, or digging into what happened many thousands of years ago. You've got Milankovitch cycles, which is the influence that the Earth's orbit has on its climate. Then you've got things like aerosol science, investigating these tiny particles, and which ones heat and which ones cool the planet, as well as the influence that they have on clouds. And then of course we've got the side of climate science that we hear the most about greenhouse gases. Gases like carbon dioxide and methane absorb the longer wavelength light that is emitted by Earth. These are just some of the many, many sides of climate science that researchers study, and I feel like I'm probably pissing off some of my friends by forgetting to mention their specific subdiscipline. If you want a rocket that can both lift off and avoid crashing into the moon, then you need lots of different rocket scientists. And if you want to understand the climate properly, then you need lots of different subfields. Together, all these things tell us how the climate will respond when the Earth goes through changes. Say the sun gets brighter and hotter, how will the Earth's climate change then? Or say humans emit loads of greenhouse gases and aerosols into the atmosphere, what happens then? In the 1970s, these research fields were worked on mostly in isolation from one another, and there were four key groups of scientists working at the time. Those looking at global average temperatures, those looking at geology, those looking at aerosols, and those studying the so-called greenhouse gases. And these different groups of scientists came to some shocking conclusions. The first reconstruction of global average temperatures to show a cooling trend was published in 1963 by John Murray Mitchell. What he did was take measurements from over 200 different measuring stations run by the World Meteorological Organization and combine them into a global average. What he found was that from the start of the record, about 1880, running up till about 1940, the world had warmed slightly. And then from 1940 up until the time of publication in 63, the world had cooled. By the time the 70s rocked up, it was widely accepted that the world had cooled since about 1940. And when new satellite observations came out, this was backed up because ice was growing all over the Northern Hemisphere. 
At the same time, geologists were realizing that the Earth had gone through periods of extraordinary climate change in the past. Up until the mid-20th century, the working theory of geologists was that there have been a few short ice ages in the recent past, with long warm periods between them. But work by scientists like Wallace Brooker and Cesare Emiliani showed that actually the past contained long periods of the Earth being covered by ice sheets, with relatively short interglacials taking place between these periods. Further, these ice ages were caused by slight variations in the Earth's orbit around the Sun, as described mathematically by Serbian scientist Milutin Milankovic. His theory, published back in 1930, was originally discredited because it just didn't match with the record of past climate. But with the discovery of these extensive, extended ice ages, it became clear that he was right all along. A group of scientists led by James Hayes, using Milankovic's mathematics, predicted that the long-term trend over the next several thousand years is towards extensive northern hemisphere glaciation. Or, in other words, that we were due to slip into a new ice age at some point in the next several thousand years. So one group of scientists had found that the Earth had been cooling for several decades, and another group of scientists had found that the Earth was due to enter a new ice age. But things got really tasty when we added humans into the mix. The third group, the scientists studying aerosols, those are these small little particles like soot or dust or salt, found that human economic activity had increased the amount of aerosols in the atmosphere. And crucially, that the more aerosols there are in the atmosphere, less of the sun's radiation is reaching the surface. Or in other words, human economic activity, increasing the number of aerosols in the atmosphere, had cooled the Earth. And that anthropogenic cooling might be enough to push the Earth into its next predicted ice age. It's a smoking gun! Global cooling, it's gonna happen! Certainly how the press at the time reported this. So why did scientists stop with the global cooling narrative? In this graph, you can see the number of papers published on the subject of global cooling in total over the 60s and 70s. Steadily increasing, but plateauing at the end of the 70s. No more papers were being published on the subject. But why? Well, let's plot on the same graph the total number of papers published on the subject of global warming, so the heating of the planet by greenhouse gases. There was not a single year in the 1960s 70s, or any decade since, in which global cooling was the prevailing theory in the scientific community. So why did scientists change their mind and flip from global cooling to global warming? Well, they didn't. Global warming has always been the consensus in the scientific community when you measure the peer-reviewed publications. This idea of the big global cooling scare of the 1970s and that scientists changed their mind is a myth. It's simply not supported by the data. Some scientists were concerned about the idea of the Earth entering into a new ice age for the exact reasons that I just outlined. And so would you, if presented with only that information, you would draw the same conclusion logically. However, those scientists concerned about global cooling were not considering the elephant in the room, the topic of the fourth research group, greenhouse gases. After an aerosol-induced ice age was first posited in that letter to President Nixon and in a scientific paper by Russell and Schneider in 1971, subsequent publications, including some by those original authors, found that the hypothesis had overestimated how much cooling aerosols would produce, and at the same time had underestimated how much warming greenhouse gas emissions like carbon dioxide would produce. Because the more carbon dioxide that humans put into the atmosphere, the more heat is trapped, causing warming. And the whole thing becomes a question of balance. Of all of these factors, some of them negative, producing cooling, like aerosols, and some of them positive, producing warming, like carbon dioxide, what is the net total effect on the world's climate? Since the 1970s, researchers have been investigating all the pieces of the climate puzzle individually, but they've also been putting the puzzle together. Scientists have looked at changes in the solar radiation arriving at Earth and shown that, well, it's had a pretty tiny influence. I mean, the sun is very important. Without it, 
I mean, I don't need to explain why the sun is important, but my point here is that there haven't been any significant solar changes, and so there hasn't been a significant influence on the world's temperature change. We also look at human influence on the climate, and we now understand that aerosols have overall probably had a cooling effect, although there's still a lot to understand about these pesky particles. But by far the biggest piece of the climate puzzle, and you're going to be so shocked by this, is greenhouse gases, most importantly carbon dioxide. The warming from these gases has been amplified by water vapour, which is also a greenhouse gas. Putting together the pieces of this climate puzzle, we see that the heating from these gases far outweighs any other influence. And honestly, this is what we'd expect. Without natural CO2 in the atmosphere, the world would be far too cold for comfort. So it would be pretty bizarre if pumping billions more tonnes of this gas into the atmosphere didn't substantially heat things up. There's still uncertainty, of course. For a given scenario of future human emissions, we can't be sure whether we're in for 3 degrees or 5 degrees of global warming. But one thing is clear. Greenhouse gases are by far the biggest piece of the global temperature puzzle. So, if we don't stop emitting them, we know we're in for a picture of more and more global warming. Starting in 1978 with a seminal paper by James Hansen and his colleagues, science figured out that the net total effect of humans on the planet is global warming, with the cooling effect of aerosols being outweighed by the warming effect of greenhouse gases. And sure enough, since the 1970s we have seen undeniable warming. The apparent cooling phase of the 40s was actually primarily in the northern hemisphere alone, while the southern hemisphere continued to warm. And that cooling phase has given way to decade on decade of global warming. The world is approximately 1 degree Celsius warmer now than it was in the 1970s. Contrary to what a lot of online commenters think, this is bang on what James Hansen predicted would happen happen back in the 80s, and we can be extremely confident therefore that this warming trend is going to continue. We have the science nailed down. What we as scientists now need to do is get better at predicting how much warming is going to take place in the future, and what the consequences of that warming will be. And that means understanding better how changes in economic activity will change emissions of greenhouse gases, and understanding things like feedback loops, which will determine if signals that we put into the climate get amplified by natural processes. Ongoing research is absolutely crucial. If we are to avoid catastrophic warming, we know that we need to bring our net emissions of greenhouse gases down to zero. And that's going to take effort from individuals, such as by flying less, by eating less meat, and by changing energy providers to those using renewable sources. But it's also going to take structural change, which means we need action from governments, which is why protests like the recent climate strike are so incredibly important. We need action both from the bottom up and from the top down together. The scientific debate about whether we are warming or cooling the planet is over. It has been for decades. And it's also been clear for decades that the predicted warming is really happening and is really serious. What is needed now is not debate because it's not going to get us anywhere. What is needed now is action to protect our children and ourselves from the effects of that warming before it gets any worse. If you enjoyed this video, then there's a good chance you are interested in the future trajectory of the Earth's climate, whether that's warmer or cooler. I'll give you a hint though, it's warming. And so you may have seen the recent IPCC report on warming in the world's oceans. Like all IPCC reports, it's a somewhat baffling array of graphs with large uncertainties and multiple possible futures. If you want to get better at understanding these reports, and graphs in general, then you should check out a course on statistics on Brilliant.org. Brilliant is a mix of interactive quizzes, exercises, and beautifully explained problems that bring learning about even potentially dry topics like statistics to life. The interactive problems in particular are really fun. 
I've said before that I wish Brilliant had been around when I was at school, and I really do mean that. In particular, I really disliked statistics when I first learned them, and a tool like Brilliant would have helped me out immeasurably. But whether you're at school, at college, or simply an interested adult, learning about maths and science through the site is easy, fun, and you can even do it on your commute. You can use parts of Brilliant for free, and if the expertly written courses sound good to you, then check out brilliant.org forward slash Simon Clark. And the first 200 people to use promo code Simon Clark will get 20% off their premium annual subscription. Thank you for watching the video, and a very special thanks must go to Dr. Adam Levy for helping me out with making it. Say hi, Adam. Hello, Adam. For the record, Simon made me make that awful joke. If you're interested in learning more about the Earth's climate or about climate change, then go and check out Adam's YouTube channel. So I started my YouTube channel when I was still studying for my doctorate in atmospheric physics at the University of Oxford. Climate change can be so overwhelming and I wanted to make videos that made it feel a bit more straightforward and approachable. And that's what Climate Adam is. It's a place where we can all have a slightly less stressful climate chat. Go and subscribe to Adam's channel, and you can subscribe to this one as well if you liked this and want to see more. And if you did enjoy the video, pop it a like, let me know what you thought in the comments, and also give it a share. If there's someone who you think might enjoy this video, do give it a share on your socials, because it really helps spread the video. That's everything I've got to say, really. Um, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.